Tom Woods Show, episode 1784. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, by now you've probably noticed that news about the virus is almost always fact-free hysteria these days. So you need my brand new free ebook, Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About the Lockdown. Go pick it up at wrongaboutlockdown.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. Well, this is a long-awaited episode, isn't it? Thaddeus Russell versus Michael Rechtenwald. Well, I'm going to make you wait for a second. Like the salivating dogs that you are, I'm going to just make you hang on for just a second because I want to start off by rectifying an injustice. This was an oversight on my part, and when I do something wrong, I want to own up to it and fix it. I have a Tom Wood Show listener who has a very cute little Etsy store with wonderful, beautiful gift ideas, a lot of them Christmas-themed, and I feel like in this day and age, we really need to support each other. So I tell you this will be going to a good cause, namely a Tom Wood Show listener, and the site is a little bit tookish. Dot com. So a little bit and then T-O-O-K-I-S-H dot com. And I meant to do this a long time ago and somehow I just overlooked it. So help me help them uh, overcome my stupidity by paying a visit to a little bit tookish dot com and maybe buying a gift there. Uh, they have mugs and cute little items that you can get for people you don't know. You know you need to get them something and you don't know what and all that. This is a perfect little shop for precisely that. So I wanted to give them a little bit of a shout here and send some Tom Woods traffic their way. All right, now, longtime listeners will know the names Thaddeus Russell and Michael Rechtenwald. They've both been guests on the Tom Woods Show. They're both academics. They, they're both PhDs. Uh, Thaddeus and I were both at, the, uh, at Columbia University in the history department getting our PhDs at about the same time, as a matter of fact. We even met briefly once. You've heard that story if you listen to my episode on the unregistered podcast with Thad Russell. And uh, Michael Rechtenwald, I've had a chance to meet in person, and I've featured him a number of times on the podcast. And I am very fond of both of these men. And uh, I'll have their websites also at tomwoods.com slash 1784. And that is for Thaddeus, we've got renegadeuniversity.com. And for Michael, we have michaelrechtenwald.com. So, they are going to debate the following resolution. Postmodernist philosophy is consistent with the politics of individual liberty. Thaddeus is arguing in the affirmative and Michael in the negative. Now, unlike other debates where I've interjected here and there, I'm really going to let these two more or less just go at it. And unless there's anything below the belt, I'm just going to let it go because I think that will be of benefit to people listening. So, that's the ground rule. The ground rule is there really are no rules except just be respectful of each other, but I know I don't need to tell that to these men. Now, since Thad is arguing in the affirmative, the traditional debate style says that he goes first. So, Thad, you have, let's say, five to seven minutes to lay out your case. Awesome. Uh, that's great. Thank you. I'd love to start off here. Um, I want to start off by telling everyone where I'm coming from on this, because I think a lot of people sort of, because of what they've been told about, quote, postmodernism over the last three or four years by people like Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris and the intellectual dark web, not Michael Rechtenwald, by the way. Michael Rechtenwald is someone who's actually studied this and who I actually respect. And that's one of the reasons I'm here to, to debate him, because I actually think he really knows this stuff, unlike those guys. A lot of people have been listening to, though, others ranting about postmodernism over the last three years, clearly haven't read, done the reading. Um, and they assume that anyone who speaks positively about postmodernism is therefore a social justice warrior who wants to throw you off campus and accuse you of being a racist and talk about how the fact that you're a cis, het, white man means everything about you. Uh, that's not me. I, am, I hate, hate Everything, pretty much, that goes on in university campuses. I'm pretty famous for that, as a matter of fact. I've talked about this on Tom's show several times. I've talked about it on my show countless times. I've talked about it all over the place. I am probably better known for my hatred of higher education these days than my, um, my admiration for some, let me underscore that, some postmodernist thinking. Um, I, I believe, and I think Michael will mostly agree with me on this, although I know he doesn't entirely agree with me on this, that what Jordan Peterson and company have been complaining about, what they've been claiming is that postmodernism, in quotes, 
is the cause, the source, the intellectual basis of what is now called social justice or identity politics on campus, both of which I absolutely loathe. For me, and I know Michael will at least, I think mostly agree with me on this, for me, the sources of that politics are not Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, Jean-Francois Lyotard, who are universally known as postmodernist proper thinkers and philosophers. The source of that stuff coming out of campuses is the Frankfurt School. That's, those are the intellectual granddaddies of this stuff. And I know that Michael has devoted quite a bit of his research and writing and speaking. In fact, I'd say the, it sounds, seems to me like most of what he does is attack the Frankfurt School, for, for which I say, hallelujah, God bless you, go brother. The people who came over from Germany in the 1930s and 40s, who constituted what we now know as the, Frank, now known as the Frankfurt School, and the most famous proponents or members of that school of thought are Theodore Adorno, Max, Theodore Adorno, Max Horkheimer, and Herbert Marcuse. And let me just say right now, when I was an undergraduate, and I think this was only my second year in college, and this would have been way back in 1986 when I was in college, I wrote a paper on Herbert Marcuse's repressive tolerance essay. And I thought, because everybody at my college thought he was the greatest thing in the world, and all of the American left, which I was then a part of, thought he was the greatest thing in the world, I read his essay and I said, this is straight up totalitarianism. He's saying in that the argument, and everybody should go read it, by the way, it's not hard to read. And Michael and I, are, I'm sh- we're all on the same page on this, I'm sure. In that essay, which became a book, uh, Marcuse says, well, because capitalism is so repressive, in all its ways, by, by, lure, by hypnotizing the masses with mass media and entertainment, et cetera, et cetera, and false information, it is not just justified, but it is a moral obligation for revolutionaries, and he called for a worldwide revolutionary, to enact its own repression, to repress any claims that could be associated with the establishment, with traditional power, anything that is part of what they consider to be capitalism. And I also think that their understanding of capitalism was moronic, essentially, and a caricature. So I can say that too. Now, so that's, that's who I am. Um, I, I despise what's going on here. I just simply think that the attribution of cause is misplaced. For me, and again, it's really only basically three thinkers. Again, it's Foucault, especially, but also Jacques Derrida and Lyotard and a handful of other postmodernists. By the way, there are many people who are called postmodernists who really are, really are smuggling in Marxism in their thinking. And that's a whole other list of thinkers. We can talk about them separately. I don't like them at all either. Marxists hate postmodernists. Everyone should go read the Jacobin article, which came out last year, attacking Foucault. There's actually been several articles in Jacobin, the famous socialist magazine, which is published out of Brooklyn. They despise Foucault, and we can get into why. But for me, Foucault in particular is just, oh, let me also add this as to who I am. And I've said this to Tom on his show. I've said it on my show. As for politics, uh, public policy, I have never heard anything spoken by an ANCAP, an anarcho-capitalist, or an Austrian economist that I didn't actually agree with. So if I said to Tom, I, I said this to Tom on my show, if I were a congressperson, my voting record would look identical to Ron Paul's. It would be impossible to distinguish between us. In terms of public policy, economics, and the state, the analysis of the state, I believe that not just libertarians, but that wing of libertarianism is correct. I have been won over over the last, I don't know what it's been, five to 10 years, I guess, since I've been studying it. And a lot of this I've learned, as I said to Tom, on his show. But from reading and just being in this world now. Um, that's who I am, everyone. And what I, all I'm saying is, so I want, I want libertarians, I want anarcho-capitalists to do this. I want them to continue to do exactly what they're doing in politics. When it comes to public policy, economics, and the state, you go. I don't want to change any of that. I don't even necessarily want to modify that. What I'm saying is that there is a philosophy that has been propounded by a handful of French philosophers beginning in the 1960s, who we now call call postmodernists, who I think, and by the way, many libertarians are now listening to me, and there's a whole lot of libertarian podcasts I've just been finding out that are now embracing this idea. These thinkers, I think, are a wonderful addition 
supplement to libertarian thought because what they do is they attack in particular truth claims and they say most of the truth claims they are interested in attacking if you look at the history of them and that's what they do they just write the history of various truth claims and Foucault was explicit about this the truth claims that he and all of them really have been interested in primarily in attacking the three I'm talking about Foucault, Derrida, and Leotard, have come from the state. The state has assigned people genders, sexes, races, and all sorts of attributes that they claim to be biological and essential and unchangeable. Those categories largely have been created and then, more importantly, deployed by the state across the world throughout the modern age, almost always for nefarious purposes, almost always to limit, and here it is, limit the freedom of people. Because if you say, well, Tom, you know what, man, Michael and me, Thad, you're cis, white, hetero men, um, and that means the following about you, right? That's what we were being told by social justice warriors who now, and it is totally true, have now begun to take over not just major media outlets, but also the Democratic Party large wing of the Democratic Party, even Joe Krusty Biden, <laughs> who probably doesn't understand any of this stuff, is speaking the words, not of postmodernism, but of the Frankfurt School. The Frankfurt School is the totalitarian impulse here. It's the totalitarian school of thought that is the origin of all social justice. Michel Foucault and Derrida say, you know what? All these things that the state and authorities have... And, and by the way, science, in the name of science, like the COVID scientists right now, the whole, that army of COVID scientists who are working with the state to do what to us? Imprison us. What Tom Woods has done heroically over the last several months is what Foucault did. He said, Foucault said, I am using reason against rationalism, by which he meant scientism, which is the blind faith in authority and in particular scientific authority, which you see in people who wear masks when they're all alone in their cars because they have heard from authority and scientific authority that that's what you're supposed to do. And what Tom has done was he said he has used their own reason, their own scientific method, their own reasoning to attack this blind faith that whatever the science, whatever Anthony Fauci and all the thousands of scientists who work with the government have said uh, is is ridiculous. It's, it's an attack on that. It's a, an attack on that belief, that fundamental just reflexive belief that whatever scientists and the authorities and the state say is true. When all we have to do, and this is what Foucault said, and I'll wrap up here, what Foucault did in his books, especially, and every libertarian, I, I promise you, if you read Foucault's books, especially his first two major books, Madness and Civilization and Discipline and Punish. You know what those books are? Those are histories of two institutions. The mental asylum, where the state put people in prisons and called them crazy, often for having ideas that Tom Woods and Thad Russell and Michael Rechtenwald have. His other book, Discipline and Punish, was a history of the prison. Again, the most horrific state institution. Correct, everyone, right? And he shows how the prison was modified in the modern age to be even more repressive and totalitarian because it insisted, it, built its, it was built around the project of convincing the prisoners that what they had done, regardless of what they had done, even if they had just sold some marijuana, was evil, bad, uncivil, unseemly for a citizen. They got prisoners to internalize the shame that served the state. Once you internalize shame about these things, about the laws and the norms that the state imposes, there is no need for cops or prisons because we do it to ourselves. We imprison ourselves. And that's exactly what's happening with COVID, right? So that's where I'm coming from. That's what I want to do. I am simply trying to introduce some elements of, of what is known as postmodernism into libertarian thought, and it is simply an augmentation. There is no, in no way do I think this threatens a piece of it, not a single piece of the, all the major and even minor points that are coming out of libertarianism, Austrian economics, anarcho-capitalism, 
And that is my opening statement. Thank you for listening. Sorry for taking so long. All right. Thank you, Thad. Michael, now the floor is yours. Thank you, Thad. And I appreciate the uh, introduction. And uh, I appreciate a lot about what you've just said. Uh, and I agree with a great deal of it. Uh, I'm on the exact same page with you with reference to the Frankfurt School. Uh, Marcuse's essay, Repressive Tolerance, is totalitarianism. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, the tactics of social justice warriors are absolutely neo-Marxist. Yep. They are employing the tactics of neo-Marxism all the way down. Yes. But, but I, have a dif- I have to make a distinction here, and that has to do with the epistemology, which I think is a postmodernist epistemology. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, you take postmodernism as an anything goes, uh, it's it's anything goes sort of epistemological subjectivism and, and skepticism and so forth as epistemic humility, that the rejection of master narratives is liberatory. Mm-hmm. And on its face, this sounds fine, um, but I think there's a problem, and here's what I think the problem is. I differ that because. When coupled with uh, the premium that Foucault and Leotard and others in the postmodern school have placed on power and power struggles, we have a problem where, where uh, objective constraints are thrown out. Whenever there is no any approach to anything like truth or any criteria for the judgment of facts, this opens us up to the arbitrary imposition of beliefs to authoritarianism. Uh, when my truth is as good or better than any objective truth or any attempts to approach it, then when one has power, one can impose uh, one's claims with apparent impunity because there's no pushback against this belief. There's no objective criteria. There's no court of appeal other than authority. And that's what we see going on with the SJWs. My truth becomes elevated and you, nothing you can say, no court of appeal, no appeal to facts. Is, is even allowed. So that's what's getting thrown out with postmodernism. And I don't say that you're throwing it out, but to the extent you are, I think it's a mistake. I have to say that. Uh, we do see this playing out in the social justice movement. If, if we take transgenderism to be a piece of it, which I do, mm-hmm. when, I, when unmoored from belief, when, when such belief is unmoored and backed by mobs and institutions, it leads to the abolition of other people's rights, including their right to speak, and in some cases, their right to live. One is required to acknowledge the self-described genders of believers and to use their self-assigned pronouns or else. Stephen Hicks has a different explanation. He suggests that this authoritarianism and and the uh, connection to the epistemology is just incidental, that, you know, it just so happens that Uh, People like Stanley Fish, who in his most recent book, The First, argued for the curtailment of the First Amendment, including eliminating a religious speech in the public square and the elimination of speech that others find offensive uh, offensive or harmful, is just an incidental relationship. And, you know, I think it's interesting that Camille Paglia has called Fish a totalitarian Tinkerbell. My explanation is that there is an intrinsic problem here. And that is, if we take complete subjectivism, skepticism, and relativism as a recipe, then we open the door to authoritarianism when they have the requisite power to enforce beliefs that, are, that have no court of appeal from which to differ with, with which to differ with them. And, and the other point I want to make is this: is that crediting postmodernism with with the gains of liberation movements like feminism, black rights, etc., you know that because uh, postmodernism allows people to escape social constructs. I don't think it's necessary. I I don't think that feminism needs postmodernism. Why? Well, I think that even the constructivism of feminism has caused problems for feminists, a great deal of problems. Uh, For example, the notion of social constructivism and psychoanalytic theory have become boxes that feminists have been trying to fight their way out of ever since. you know, this kind of social determinism uh, is just as deterministic as biological determinism in, in the minds of those who hold it. You know, for, for feminists, this is a en- never-ending struggle to undo the effects of the patriarchy or the phallus, as in the case of the psychoanalytic feminist followers of Jacques Lacan. But the ironic result, unfortunately, is that gender constructivism 
is that now feminism is being run with people with penises. This, this is what constructivism has allowed to take place. Talk about the patriarchy entering the back door. And that, you know, gender as a social construct, as I said, can be as deterministic as biological determinism. And unfortunately, it's, it's and I, you know, to the degree that you differ with this, I would argue that you're not a postmodernist. Because under postmodern theory, the very notion of the self is denied. It becomes nothing but a mere effect, like a product of language or other social factors. You know, the self is quote unquote decentered, that is removed from the center of history and importance and its agency virtually denied. We see this in Foucault and Roland Barthes, a precursor in the post structuralist realm, uh, in their essays, The Death of the Author and What is an Author, respectively. They argue that authors do not create texts, texts produce their authors. Authors, and by extension, the human subject is a mere product. And, you know, Francois, uh, Jean uh, Francois Lyotard in the postmodern condition said that the self is a node, a mere node in a communication circuit. Leotard demoted the self quite explicitly. He said, and each of us knows that our self does not amount to much. A self does not amount to much. And this is hardly a formula for self-determination, which requires individual agency, a belief in individual agency, and a that agency uh, that is denied, I think, by postmodernism. So libertarianism requires individualism, and postmodernism, unfortunately, denies the individual. And to the extent that you uh, value the individual, which I do believe you do, to that extent, I don't think you're a postmodernist, to be honest. Hmm. And to the extent that you buy into the denial of self-determining individual, and I'm not sure to what extent you buy it at all, you wouldn't be libertarian. Um, and, and that's basically my opening statement. Okay. All right. So I'll give Thad a couple of minutes to respond to that and then vice versa, and then we'll move on. Cool. Yeah, great. So, Michael, you said that you favor, ob these were your words, objective constraints on discourse. Acknowledgement so of I, them, yes. Uh, well, you said there really isn't freedom without, the, without objective constraints on discourse. No, not on discourse. Uh, objective constraints on how we proceed, you know, because the freedom is meaningless without acknowledgement. It's not meaningful or good without the acknowledgements of these constraints. Okay. imposed by the object world and imposed by other people's rights. Mm -hmm. So I, would, I guess I would ask for specific objective constraints, which is, by the way, what Foucault does, right? He takes, he takes claims about objective constraints that are necessary for this or that purpose, and then he tells the history of them. And he finds, yeah. in every, right, he finds in every case an origin, an origin in the minds of human beings, not in God, not in nature. So here's an objective constraint. So in World War I, and I know a lot of Tom's listeners know about this, in World War I, the federal government, and I think this happened in Europe as well, uh, they put out these budgets for working class families to follow. They said, you know, it is just objectively true. You only need X grams of flour per week. It's objectively true that your children do not need candy, so don't buy any for them. And then this guy named Ludwig von Mises came along and the Austrian School of Economics came along and said, well, you know what? Value, guys, economic value is what? Subjective. <laughs> and so they threw that out. They, they demolished in one fell swoop with a brilliant idea. The idea is really more like um, just throwing off the attempts of the state to tell us what is true. Mm -hmm what is objectively a constraint that is necessary for a good civilization, which is what the state tells us constantly. The state and its allies, right? And here's another objective constraint you brought up, feminism. An objective constraint was placed on women. And this was not just the state, it was the culture at large, but the state absolutely enforced it in all sorts of ways, as we well know. It was, it was just known. It was just a, quote, objective fact. It was, quote, an objective constraint that women were unable to hold public office, that women couldn't function in the public sphere, that women were best suited to cooking and cleaning and being wives and mothers. And then feminism came along and made a very postmodernist move because, of course, it arose at exactly the time of postmodernism, second wave feminism in the 60s and 70s. And they said, you know what? Let's look at the history of this. And you had this whole raft of feminist historians. And this, by the way, was when feminism was good. I can't stand, cannot stand the modern incarnation of feminism. But this, in the second wave, 
parts of the second wave made a crucial, crucial intervention. They said, let's, let's look at the history of this. And they found, once again, that not only were ideas about women's essential biological limitations invented by not just men, men and women, people, at particular times in history for particular purposes, right? But that here's the thing. Those so-called constraints, those rules, those, those facts about women that were widely believed by scientists, by the state, and by most people changed over time. They changed over time and they changed over space. So right now, as we speak, all across Southeast Asia, there are governments that have three, four, five, six different legal categories of sex and gender. If you've ever known, if you've ever heard about lady, the lady boys of Thailand, you know what I'm talking about. These are legal categories established by those governments, even, and by the culture at large. Now, are we to say that they're just wrong and we're right? How do we know that? But I want to know which objective constraints you want us to hold on to. I, to me, as a as a small l cultural libertarian, and this is what I'm really talking about here: cultural libertarianism, cultural freedom. Which objective constraints on my discourse do you really want to hold on to and enforce? Okay. I find that I find that profoundly actually anti-libertarian. Not at all. Okay. Okay, let's take biological determinism, for example. Mm-hmm. Forget about categories for a minute, like gender categories or race categories and so forth. We are more or less biologically determined. And ignoring the extent, the extent of our biological determination can be extremely ex- dangerous. For example, we are biologically determined not to have wings, and thus unaided we can't fly. So jumping off a bridge and thinking that one can fly is a dangerous denial of our biological determination. Mm-hmm. We are more or less biologically determined. The, the key to it is to find out just how biologically determined we are and in what ways. What what areas of, of our lives are determined biologically and which ones aren't. And then we can proceed apace to develop a libertarian approaches to those matters. And, and the idea that freedom is some sort of willy-nilly uh, denial of, 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 of constraints is very, it's very bad. You, you can't, you, you got to acknowledge that there are impositions uh, by the object world, and also impositions of other people's rights. Those are constraints. They're constraints that have to be acknowledged. Otherwise, like I said, you'll end up flying, trying to fly off of a, a building or jumping from the third, 13th floor of a, mm-hmm. of a building thinking that gravity is a social construct. Right. Uh, the, the, the theory, here's the thing. Okay, there, there's a bit of a conflation going on here, and that is the conflation between knowledge, which is, of course, in some sense, always socially constructed. Mm-hmm. Knowledge is undoubtedly a social construct, oh. but the object world that it refers to is not. It, to the extent that we don't change it, it is not socially constructed. So there, there is a distinction to be na- made between knowledge and what we're talking, what the knowledge in effect refers to, or is at least corresponding to in some sense to a greater or lesser degree. Of course, there, it's always an asymptotic approach to, the, to, the, right. to, to reality. We never get there, ever. We never really get there. But we have to hold some standard of that, or else we have no guideposts. And like, for example, uh, I think it's really a kind of a conflation also to conflate something like genetics, which is the science, with engineering projects like eugenics, which is not science. It is an engineering project <laughs> that's derived from the use of science by some people. And science itself is not one singular essential entity. It is, uh, and that's a bit of an essentialism to suggest that it is science is a vast array of enterprises undertaken by many different people with many disagreements within them. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and getting back to the issue of gender and sex, gender, you know, there was an introduction in 1955 by John Money. This was the first time that gender, when he talked about gender roles, he was a sexologist, he talked about gender roles and he's, he introduced this notion of gender into the human discourse with reference to what was then called sex difference. And this is this then, he used it in the context of what he called gender roles, and then it became gender roles are socially constructed. Absolutely. Gender roles are socially constructed. Then gender is socially constructed. Yes, if we mm-hmm. consider that gender is in effect gender roles, I agree. 
The question is about sex. Is sex socially constructed? Our ideas about it might be, but the thing itself isn't. And thank goodness for that, because those who despise the human race might have us never reproducing again. It, it's necessary to have sex difference for reproduction. This is obviously right. a point. And there's different kinds of social constructivism. In fact, I'm a, I'm a, I consider a moderate constructivist. And that is to say, I hold that science represents the natural objects and the social and political order rather than one exclusively. It's not either or, it's both. Mm -hmm. This is a standpoint that was developed in science studies, which I, which I studied uh, as part of my PhD. In fact, I write in the history of science that scientific uh, artifacts are consensual products of scientific debate that are both artifactual, that is, constructed and natural. There is some correspondence between what they refer to. The question is, to what extent are they right? Mm -hmm. And why do we need to hold on to science? Let's, let's take a look at Lysenkoism in the Soviet Union, for example. Lysenkoism threw out Darwinian science because it was deemed to be counterproductive to socialism. Why? Because... Well, Lysenkoism was a neo-Lamarckian idea. It was the notion of the adaptation according to the uh, acquired characteristics. And the, the reason why socialists prefer that is because then we could change everything because we can change the social environment. Therefore, we can change everything and we can make it according to our social dictates, equality, and so on and so forth. But, you know, despite Marxism claiming to be materialist and so on and so forth and objective, and this this Lysenkoism was effectively idealist. It didn't have any correspondence to what was the best science at the time. And, and as a result, you have a state policy that led to widespread famine and death, as well as one of the worst witch hunts in the history of science. This underscores the danger of denying our best science uh, in, in preference to just anything goes, and they're all just narratives. Right. There was a better biological science at the time. It was called Darwinism and the model of natural selection. Agreement with it could have saved millions of lives. Okay. I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. What do you think is objectively true in terms of causation uh, between one's biology and a socially significant fact? Not, not jumping off a bridge without wings, but, you know, Things that, you know, public policy could be written around, politics can be formed around. What, what is it about human beings that is just objectively true? We can't do it, no matter how much we talk about it, it's just a fact. And, this, and the fact is socially significant, meaning that our politics can and should be built around it. What, what about me? What about women? What about black people? Again, I didn't even talk about the history of right, science and yeah. race. Right. And, and, and by the way, let me just add this about women, just that issue, and, and blacks too, everybody. Um, science, has it not changed its mind radically over and over again, right mm -hmm. up to the present moment about what women are? It certainly has. Of course. Right? So, can you, so, so, tell me, so tell me what it is about me or women or anybody that is it just object, an objective truth that has social significance. Well, to I, don't, significance I, to it. I don't know the extent to which there's oh. genetic determinism. And one of the reasons we don't know, it, is, it has been proscribed in effect, now on university campuses all over the world, especially in the U.S. and Great Britain, it has been proscribed. We're not allowed to investigate the question because it reeks of eugenics, oh, but it doesn't minute. necessarily reek of eugenics. Well, we but, don't. Come on. We are not allowed to find out to the extent to which, for example, evolutionary history has determined something about the male of our species and the female of our species, or any other configuration that might arise in our species, such as intersex people, and I agree they exist, uh, we don't know the extent to which biology has determined these things because it hasn't been pursued. That line of inquiry has been cut off. That, that's one thing. That's really disingenuous, Michael. Come on, you know that- No, you, it's not. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, so for, cer certainly, I mean, I agree with you in English departments and in sociology departments, you are absolutely not allowed to even raise the question. There's no doubt about that. But you know very well that lots of people, Charles Murray is just the most famous example. And he wasn't right? allowed to speak at Middlebury. He was, but he, he did. No, 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 no. But his book was a bestseller. His book friend. was a bestseller, but he's not allowed <laughs> to speak at the center of academic discourse. No, but it's, because no, but I'm saying, what in Charles Murray's book is convincing to you? About I don't. The biological... I, I, I'm not going to adjudicate Charles Murray's book. Well, what I'm trying, I, I don't think it's that's right. really 
But, but, that's, but that's, get, an, that's a trap you're trying to set to, 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 to let bait me, finish. me into some sort of determinism let me finish. that will be deemed racist, sexist, or otherwise. You know, so that not, is not at, all what I'm, not at all what I'm trying to do. Um, but I want to say, but come on, it is still disingenuous because you know that until about five to ten years ago, it's been very recent, people all over the world have been, been doing just this kind of research, right? And then still to this day, there are people doing research in universities about IQ and race and IQ and gender and all that stuff. It is, it is out there. It is abundant. But until very recently, not only was it allowed, that was the dominant mode of, that was one of the dominant fields in science and biology, as I've said, you know, until very, very recently. And basically until the 21st century, we have stacks and stacks and stacks of books about how women are biologically this or that and to suffer from these nervous disorders because they're women. How about black? We know about blacks and Mexicans and all and Chinese and Japanese and how they are biologically different from whites and therefore we have to do this, that, and the other thing to them. This is all... Yes, there's a difference between inquiry and state you, policy and I'm not you, advocating for any state policy. No, but you have, you have 200 years of science, scientists working at places like Harvard and Yale and Columbia and Berkeley and Stanford, right? Doing exactly this kind of work. Well, so well see- before the, arri- the, the arrival of notions like epigenetics and other various uh, scientific approaches to the question that have not been even touched. But you said you want you don't know how much is genetically determined because it is not. But wait, because it, you said because it's not allowed to be spoken on college campuses. But my goodness, two hundred years. Two hundred years. But have, as you have said, such research would be outmoded by now, and it is. But why can't you read that research? Because it's outmoded. I would like to know what's the what do you, current. What do you mean? Is outmo- you can't find it on JSTOR. You can't get you it. Sure, in a you can store? find it. I'm, I would be interested in it from a history of science perspective, but not for adjudicating such claims. Okay. It would be an interesting project in the history of science, but it's not okay. a way of gaining any kind of uh, valid knowledge about the, the state of the. Okay. W- w- would you agree that science has changed its mind on every, not just these questions, but every single question repeatedly? Yes, but I mean, I think it's, a, I think you're conflating, uh, you know, when you say science, for example, you, you conflate all the various sciences and not also you, you can, conf- you, you overlook and paper over uh, intense debate within science about everything too. Exactly. And, exactly. and let me say this, that science is is changing doesn't mean that it's arbitrary. It's you know it does not mean that it's arbitrary. It just means that it's it's it probably, it's, it's asymptotic. It's attempting to reach some conclusions, to reach some facts, sure. to, to reach an understanding of facts. I don't believe that facts, as uh, Latour and Woolgar stated in uh, Laboratory Life, are mere constructions of language. There 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 there's a better model than that. And that is this model of science that we're basically on a ship in the dark and we're sending out sonar to the, to the coast. We don't get an accurate picture of the coast, but we get some sort of outline that the coast is there. Do we? And that's good because otherwise we might shipwreck right into it. How do we, have we ever seen the, has any scientist ever seen the coast? The truth? Object of reality? Uh, no, there, is there, no, not absolutely. There, 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 no. Science does not claim right. to be able to acquire exactly. absolute truth. But that That's is weird. not, postmodernism is not necessary for that acknowledgement. It goes all the way back to David Hume and his radical empiricism, in which he said that basically the sun rises every day, or so to speak, it rises every day, but it might not tomorrow. Effectively, we don't know. It's purely probabilistic what will happen. So... Science never has claimed this sort of absolutism that you're ascribing to it. Uh Some scientific ideologues or scientists, scientismists, if you will. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is that it's not necessary to invoke postmodernism in order to understand that science is never absolutist and science has never been claiming to be absolutist. That is an imposition upon it by scientific ideologues and others. And I think the, if to the extent that postmodernists do that, they're mistaken. Well, I mean, certainly, uh, come on. Again, I, <laughs> I mean, obviously, many scientists uh, in history have claimed to have found absolute truth about, again, things like, you know, Africans being biologically inferior and women being biologically inferior and yada, yada. Do I need to go on? I mean, the... There was absolute truth claims a few hundred years before then that the sun revolved around the earth. And basically every single person believed that 
including virtually every single so-called scientist, every authority, and, and most importantly, the heads of state, right? And the church. So that was universally believed and everyone believed that that was the absolute truth that would never be overturned. And it was, in fact, what did they do to people who said, you know what, maybe, maybe the sun doesn't revolve around the earth. What happened to them? Right? They were at best scorned and ostracized, and at worst, they were burned at the stake. That, that's not science burning them at the stake. <laughs> that's social power burning them at the stake. And the other thing is, what's wrong with the, uh, the flat earth theory in your, in your estimation? Because if you're a postmodernist, it's any narrative goes. So what's the matter with the uh, flat earth theory after all? Well, why, why not just go back to it or just adopt it for your own good? What, you uh, know, what I'm saying is, so I operate in my life as if the airplane really does exist and as if the flat the earth is not flat that it's round that's that's how i operate all i'm saying and all that and this is sort of the really deep stuff that ends up being not really socially significant about epistemology but we can talk about it you know all i'm saying is that i don't know for absolute certainty that what i'm what i think i'm experiencing is really 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 objectively true i mean because as we know in other cultures including American culture not very long ago in European, not just, you know, among primitive tribes and some island in the South Pacific, but we believed that the society as a whole believed all sorts of things that we now consider to be absolutely comically absurd, right? I mean, just as of like 30, 40, 50 years ago, even the theory of gravity is being revised as we speak. I had Donald Hoffman, a very famous uh, cognitive scientist. Many listeners might know him. He's been on several podcasts and he's I'm sure a lot of your listeners respect him a lot. And he, I've had him and I've had other scientists tell me, I've had a biologist tell me that true scientists are all postmodernists because it's sort of what you said. They, they don't ever claim to have found the truth. In fact, they say their job is to only, to only disprove Science. Well, that's been science. the case since Karl Popper said this, you know, sure. in 1961, that falsification is the... Uh, is the yeah, method, but let me, not, but let me, not verification. Yeah, but let Sorry. me, yeah, yeah. So, so what I'm saying, I think your history of scientists, science is a little bit skewed here. There have been absolutely many scientists who have claimed that they found the absolute truth about something. I also think that there have been many scientists, and these are the, these are, I think you would call them good scientists, and I would simply call them postmodernists, <laughs> who say that, no, all we're doing is like knocking down the truth claims established by science. And that's what Donald Hoffman and, and other scientists have told me. That's what they have said to, in, in various places. So again, what I'm calling for is not even a threat to what you think is good science. So what I'm calling for is really not a threat to anybody here who's listening. And what you're calling for is not postmodernism. Post, uh, what you're talking about is probabilism. It's, a, it's epistemological skepticism as opposed to nihilism, a, epistemological nihilism, which is what uh, postmodernism effectively uh, advocates. If I, you look at if well, you look at Derrida, and I'm sorry he did say it. He did say it, and he said it in the context that I could explain because I've read the entire book of grammatology. Mm -hmm. There is nothing outside the text. Yes. Okay. So there's a denial of objectivity. There's an anti-objectivity. There's a not just a radical skepticism. There's a nihilism there. And I don't. If you don't, if you don't embrace that, then to that extent, you're not postmodernist. What what Derrida meant, and I think you agree. With I know that. what he meant. Well, wait. <laughs> Let me go ahead. <laughs> what what deconstructionist Derrida and most postmodernists believe is that there that language is not is not a pathway to the truth. That we do not find absolute objective reality or truth through language. That it is. It's again. It's a, it's obviously a, an invention, a construction of human beings. The English language and even human, you know, even body language right? All of it is, it's all constructed by us. And of course, that changes every single minute of every day all over the world. Yes. He said, he said, there's simply no one-to-one -one correspondence. Here you go. Between any particular word and what it claims to represent or what is claimed it represents, because these are closed systems of language. No word within English is closer to truth than any other word in the language and every word in the language, what does it do? It refers to another set of words. If you look in the dictionary, right? You, and you look for the definition of any word in the dictionary. Yes, I know. What do you, hold on, hold on. What do, you, what do you see is, what do you see is a list of other words, right? Not just synonyms, but the description is a list of words. So which, which, when do you finally get to the end where it's closest to the truth? This is not a really uh, profound acknowledgement that lang outside of language, we can't speak. That's, that's basically, uh -huh. if you want to take Derrida saying that outside of language we can't speak, 
because there's no language outside of language. That would be a rather unremarkable claim, but he's making more of a claim than that. He's making a claim that language, of course, is self-referential, but it's more than that, and this is where he's wrong. It's a tool, and to the extent that it works as a tool, it is useful, and it mm -hmm. can map onto things to an extent greater or lesser, and it helps us manipulate reality. That's a fact. It's, that's how we know that we can get in an airplane and it'll fly because the instructions that the pilot has will hold to some extent on most days. Mm -hmm. Okay, We know that, of course, some days gravity may not hold, but probabilistically it will. So right. this is why throwing out science with, with uh, postmodern theory is a radical mistake. Yeah, it, there's no there's no evidence that he was nihilistic in that way. And, and this is again, this is I think it's just a canard about about those mm -hmm. thinkers. Uh, no one is Derrida and Foucault, especially Foucault, but neither one of them were ever calling for an attack on everything and that they believed in nothing. What they're saying is values, which I hold, we all hold values are yes, they're they're con social constructions. You know, they're obvious, ob sometimes individually constructed. They weren't saying. If you value freedom, however, however you construe it, you should not pursue that. No one ever says that. Not, not among those thinkers. What they simply say is it's a social construction. If you prefer one particular value, one social construction over another, go for it, which is how I operate. I prefer right. I, all of my values I know are constructions, but I pursue them anyway. Because I just don't know that they are somehow absolute, God-given from nature, immutable, can never be changed. I know that they're inventions, essentially. Of course they're inventions, but okay. so is the airplane, and it works. Here's the thing. Uh, well, I could, I could get into why Derrida actually disappears the object world, but it's a long story that goes into you know, uh, semiotics and Saussure and all that, and his conflation of the uh, referent with the... Uh, with the um, signified and all that and, and and effectively saying language is only the signifier the signifier signifies not there and then he conflates the object with referent with the signified and as such he says that the object's not there he's saying that i've read it over and over there's no other way to read it that's not disingenuous okay. i'm sorry okay. but Th okay well this again this you know what needs to happen people need to actually read these texts for themselves and so, of grammatology in 1968. Yes, grammatology is a tough one, but people need to read these texts themselves. And I'm telling this audience right now, grammatology is just very difficult, even if you agree with it. Feel free to read it, and I don't think you'll agree with Michael's interpretation of it. Um, but certainly, if you read Foucault's work, the ones that I mentioned, Madness and Civilization, Discipline and Punish, History of Sexuality, which I didn't mention, uh, any libertarian, I'm going to say this right now, any libertarian who reads that and does not find it to be allied with their thinking um, is... Is doing a very strange no, read. I'd like to hear from no, it. Not an incorrect reading, a strange reading that I'd, so I'd like to. has a libertarian streak. There's no question about it. Oh, good. But he's not yes. a libertarian. He's not. A, <laughs> yeah, I would admit that without a question. Great. There's a libertarian streak in Foucault. I've said it otherwise. I've said it in other places. He explicitly he explicitly embraced what was then called neoliberalism in the Chicago School and Gary Becker in the 1970s, and was and that's why he's raked over the coals by. It's one of the reasons he's raked over the coals by Marxists. Again, Marxists hate his guts. Look it up. Anybody Google Marx? Not all of them. Not all. Mm, Google Marx. I, I know Google what kind of. I know what kind of Marxist you're talking about. You're talking about hardcore Orthodox Marxists who say yeah, but there's yeah, yeah. been. There's been an opening up to, of postmodernism into Marxism, a, 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 a adoption of various elements, yes. and a, a kind of uh, melding of the two into kind of hybrids of all Google, sorts. Everyone Google Marxism and postmodernism, not just Foucault. Just do that, and you'll see what I'm saying. It's that Yeah, I mean, this is. I, I wouldn't deny that postmodernists, uh, uh, that Mark, many Marxists say they hate postmodernism. I'm going to go back to Jameson. He said he, he was right. obviously right. Very, very adamant about that. Yeah. But, but there are some amalgamations there that have gone on. And there are some things there I would like to point out that the, the postmodernist maintains an underlying ethos that is very, very compatible with Marxism. And that is this oppositional uh, notion of underdogism, I would call it. What's wrong with this that? This idea of being oppositional to power, this idea of a of a classism that's not strict, it's not a strict classism based on economics, but it's nevertheless a kind of class characterization of society, and also it takes into consideration or it, it adopts a kind of uh, Nietzschean 
notion of power, but not as Hicks was saying. It's actually the opposition to power, as if everything is a power struggle and an agonistic one. Now, let me just say this. The problem with it is, in terms of the free market, it looks at everything as a zero-sum game, and that those who are on somehow in, in the wrong end of the power differential always lose. Therefore, you can't have free market exchange because there's no trust. It's always seeming like you're getting ripped off. You're getting screwed by the man. This is very compatible. This underlying ethos runs very, very much in postmodernism. It's all throughout. It's throughout Leotard. It's throughout Foucault. It's throughout Baudrillard, who you may or may not consider one of them. Uh -huh. It's throughout all of them. So there's no question in your own book, your history, uh, which is interesting, uh, and I'll probably read it, uh, it's the same way. You're looking at the <laughs> outcasts, the subalterns, the, 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 all these things are, yeah. these are all compatible with class thinking. And so there is no question, and, and there is no question that the underlying ethos share something deeply with Marxism. Well, underdogism and opposition to power sound pretty good to me, and they sound very libertarian. So The only problem with them is this. <laughs> they assume that every relationship is a zero-sum game in which I'm getting the underdog is getting yeah. screwed. So every transaction, th this is very important, every transaction in which I go to the grocery store because it's bigger than me and they have more money, right. and I go over there, I I'm being screwed. I know, excuse me, Tom, but I'm being screwed by the man. It's, there's no way that I'm getting value. Uh, and this is absolutely antithetical to libertarians. Who, who says that? Who says that? Foucault says that? Derrida says it's, that? It's, it's implicit in everything. Oh, saying. I see. It's implicit. Okay. Yeah. No, of course, everything is a power <laughs> differential. And I'm always under, you know, and the reader is always invoked or interpolated as an underdog. Yeah. who can't win, and that every transaction puts you on the bottom, and therefore every transaction is viewed with suspicion. The free market itself is seen as a place where inequ inequitable transactions are taking place. There's not a free market. Nobody among the postmodern school would embrace the free market. It's considered some place where the dominant always win. Yeah. That's a fact. They, they, they don't see, like Mises, that the consumer has the power. And, they yeah. see the producer is having all the power. Okay, so that is most certainly in Marcusa, Leotard, and Adorno, the Frankfurt School, absolutely clear, explicit hostility to the market, to capitalism, all of it. You tell me where you find what you just said in Foucault, Derrida, or any postmodernist theory. Yeah, well, the market theory. is another institution for Foucault. Just you, like you, you show me, you show me where he says that. Any of that, what you just said, and what I what I really need for people to do is not take my word for this or Michael's word for this. He's invoking these texts or he's claiming certain things in the text, and we don't have the text in front of us. People can do the two, three things. I rec strongly recommend this: take Michael's course on postmodernism and critical theory at Liberty Classroom. And take my course on what is postmodern called what is postmodernism at Renegade University. And in I don't know if you do this, I'm sure you do, but I do in my course, I do a reading. We look at we put That's the text. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you do. We put the text on the screen and read through it together. Yeah. And so take those courses and read the texts yourselves and you tell, but you can't just sort of make these claims that the text says X. And then, then when I oh, ask you can't, them, I thought that's what postmodernists do. Hold on, the text says whatever I want it to be. It's Michael, reader Michael, response theory. Michael, hold on. I yeah. let me, okay. Look, I mean, you can't say I when I when I ask you where does it say this, you say well it's implicit. Okay, so <laughs> you can't you can't really do that. It's, I mean, it's, it's got, explicit in, in terms of some institutions, but it, it's easily extended where? to the marketplace. Yeah. There's an anti-capitalist strain all throughout. Postmodern theory. There's an anti statist is, strain. In no, not just statist. It's anti capitalist as well. Look at Leotard's uh, postmodern condition. It's everywhere in there. Leotard, Leotard, definitely, I agree with you. I, I like half of what he says, and half of it is sort of warmed over Marxism. I agree with you. I'm mostly talking about Foucault and Derrida, who are the major, the, everyone agrees, are the major postmodernist thinkers. Well, Leot I mean, say Leotard's the one that actually gave the school of thought, if it can be called that, its name. So. His, his critique of meta narratives is wonderful, and every libertarian should, should totally appreciate that. You know, the only thing is, it is a meta narrative. So, I mean, it's, it's self refuting. You know, uh, uh, there, aren't, there is no truth, it's a truth claim. So that's self-refuting. No. There are no meta narratives. Is a meta narrative. So that's self-refuting. No, no, no. What no. else you got? No, 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 no. He said he he called for skepticism toward meta narratives, like the king has the divine right to the crown, to sovereignty. 
that meta narrative, right? That was a big, really big one for a long time. There's all sorts of meta narratives now, aren't there? Yes, like postmodernism about America. What? No, it's a skepticism. postmodernism is a is a meta narrative indeed. It is a meta narrative that meta narratives should not be this or that, or meta narratives should be disavowed, or meta narratives should. It is a meta narrative on in its own right. No, it's, a, no it's a suggestion that we should be skeptical of them. It does not say that there is no. Did such... you did you just make a truth claim? No, I said. Well, it's a okay then. Well, then you, what you're saying should I, should I disregard it because I don't know what to make of it if it's not a truth claim. Of course you can disregard it. It's a suggestion. Yeah. Should that's everybody they're... disregard it? That's what, that's what I'm asking. It's a suggestion. And if you like it, take it up. And if you don't like it, walk away from it. This is the beautiful thing about it. No one's requiring anyone to do anything with this. These are suggestions. Uh, all right. Let me, let me jump in here. Sure. I, I've been pretty sure. uh, laissez-faire here. <laughs> But just because people want you guys to have it out, I want to do two things and we're going to wrap up. Sure. Okay. One, I want each of you to ask the other one a question, a, a, not, a, not a speech at each other, a question. The, you got to say the question in like 15 seconds. One question, the other person has a couple minutes to answer. And then the other one will ask the other one a question. And then I'll give you each a minute or two to wrap up for the, for the whole thing. And maybe summarize where you think the other person's misconceptions lie, or something like that. But let's start with um, uh, Thad. Let's start with you. What, what what's one quick question you want Michael to answer? What do you find of value for libertarians? Because I guess this is what we're really talking about here, right? What do you find of value for libertarians in Michel Foucault's work? That's a good question. I, I think. Uh... I, I would not throw out Mich Michel Foucault is the most redeemable of all of the postmodern theorists and his histories of discipline, discipline and punish, uh, his history of the asylum and uh, madness and civilization. Uh, these are worthwhile texts to look at, absolutely, because they talk about the historicism of these various, uh, for example, in discipline and punish, he historicizes the, the history of uh, a punishment which trans is transmuted into discipline and then becomes metastasized and spreads throughout the whole social body. Uh, we, li we live in a disciplinary society. I, I, I kind of agree. His panopticism is definitely worthwhile. We're living in a panoptic on right now. Uh, no question about it. So there, there's that. And uh, I would say, um, but what I differ with, you know, I know you didn't ask me that, is this sort of demotion or absolute nihilism with reference to the self, uh, this kind of uh, anti-individualism, this idea that you know, the self is nothing but this effect of language or power or discourse or what have you. This, to me, is anathema to libertarian thought. Mm. I think Foucault is profoundly individualistic, as a matter of fact, but your turn. All right, Michael, your question. Okay, what do you think uh, postmodern, say we had a, a state, and postmodern theory, the head of this state, say whatever kind of position they call it, president, uh, ruler, whatever, was a postmodernist, how do you think such a state would operate? <laughs> that's, that's, like, that's like asking if... Um, if Tom Woods were head of the Fed, <laughs> like what would well, he Well, just do? say that, the, you know, but some people claim that Donald Trump is a postmodernist, for example. So well, what, do you th what do you think would happen? It's, just a, it's, a, it's, a silly, it's an impossible question to answer because, I mean, these guys, again, postmodernism always, as I read it, places itself outside of power as a critic of power. It's simply, that's what you do. It's, a, it's, an, it's an attitude or an orientation to power, which is one of constant skepticism constant skepticism. I can't imagine a more fundamentally libertarian way of being than to be constantly skeptical of power and authority. Or seeing it where it's not. Okay. Yeah. So there, yeah, there will, I mean, to me, I can't, there is no such thing as a postmodernist state. Um, no, I'm just, it's a hypothetical question. It, it, could, it could happen, couldn't it? I mean, everything's possible. So reification is the big postmodernist word, right? We haven't talked about yet. It's the making of ideas into real things, into facts mm -hmm. in a sense, or attempting to at least, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So once you, be, once you become the head of the state, you've obviously have reified you know, the state and mm -hmm. all of its power, all its functions. So that's simply not what a postmodernist, Foucault or Derrida or even Leotard would ever do. They would always stand outside of it. I think that's what they are inviting us to do. Again, inviting or suggesting that we do, that we stand outside of power and always never merge our identities with power and certainly never with the state. 
And even by the way, I, I, I would disagree with that. They they believe well, in. Wait, can it, I answer? Uh, can I answer the question? Can I answer? Yeah, the question? Go yeah, sure. But by the way, and so also corporations, right? And and I I'm talking to an audience that knows very well that basically every corporation in the United States and in Europe has the state helping it in all sorts of ways that are not free market mechanisms, right? So even corporations, that's power, much of which has been bestowed upon them by the state. Uh, be skeptical of them too when they make claims as they are now about white supremacy being everywhere. And you must, if you don't have a Black Lives Matter sign on your window, you are a racist. These are essentialist claims. If you're white, you are this, that, and the other thing. And if you're black, you're these other things. That's all essentialism. That's social justice essentialism. It's, it's also fundamentally racist. And it comes from the Frankfurt School. And it comes from actually race science of the 19th century. And Foucault and Derrida and the rest did everything they could to take direct aim at exactly that kind of thinking. Social justice is anathema. It is the opposite. It is a refutation of social justice, social justice politics and identity politics, where, where it is claimed that your identity means everything about you and nothing you can do about it will change that. And it is your destiny, your parts, your body parts, your skin color, that's your destiny, buddy. That's what's been being told to us now. It's what was told to us in the 19th century by scientific racists. And that's exactly, exactly what postmodernists went after was these essentialist, naturalist claims about human beings as individuals and attempts, by the way, to make them into groups, to force them into groups, to force them into women or force them into black people or force them into Americans, right? This is why I say it is completely consistent with a politics and an ethos of individualism, postmodernism. So there's my answer. Okay. Thanks. All right. Let's uh, I, I, let's each yeah. do just just because I've we we we've got a hard out here. So let's yep. let's do two minutes a piece to just say whatever you want to say. But let's try and keep it to two minutes a piece. So first Thad, then Michael. So Thad, go. Okay, I was just talking, but um, I mean, yeah, I think I've made my case. I, I'm you know, I, I I just really do. Please, you know, Jordan Peterson basically started this conversation about three years ago when he started talking about how the speech codes in Ontario were postmodernist, and then it, we found out after having listened to him talk about it for a while that Foucault, I mean, that um, Jordan never read anything <laughs> really, except I think maybe half of one book of Foucault. Mm. Those speech codes, right, um, say that trans people are born a particular way. It's just not the way that society says they were born, but they were born in a particular way, and there's nothing we can do about that. That is exactly contrary to Foucault and queer theory that came out of Foucault and feminism of the, of, of the 60s and 70s, all of which said, your body is not your destiny. Your body is not your destiny. I don't know why anybody who believes in individual personal liberty would not embrace that critique. Okay, Michael, final word. Okay, yeah, I, I would just say that to start that, as I said in the beginning, this idea of, uh, this, uh, this kind of idea of epistemological subjectivism is wide open to being, to being marshaled by and used by people that will impose their particular belief without restraint from the object world or other people's rights on other people. Because we have no court of appeal, outside of people's claims about narratives and so forth, it lends itself to being used for authoritarian purposes. That's, that's what I was getting at with the question, whether it's absurdist or not. There's a lot of absurdism in postmodern theory, so I certainly have my right to engage in a little here. But I think that we have going on here is Thaddeus is not really a postmodernist. <laughs> I, I think that he's actually just a good old fashioned classical liberal with values who values individualism, who values individual rights, who values the individual as the locus of value and sees that as the, as the main determining factor. This was all just an extension of classical liberalism. The idea of when we get into group constructs and all that leads to disasters. And it's, the answer is not to go back to social constructivism, which only looks at, which focuses on, and then reifies these categories by virtue of constantly referring to them and seeing them as the all-determining elements, whether they're perpetrated by the state or social institutions or other things, when in fact, 
a kind of demotion of that way of thinking will lead us into individualism, into thinking of people as individuals, not as members of groups. Now, you might say that because they're deconstructing these categories, that they're trying to liberate people from them. But as a matter of fact, it's led to all this grievance studies, which is about different categories and how they're struggling on this hierarchy to achieve such and such. And they're always underdogs. They're underneath somebody. They're always underneath some sort of a, they're on some sort of a totem pole where they're at the bottom. And the object, of course, is get to the top. This is definitely derived from postmodernism. Many other things are not. Uh, many other tactics of the social justice movement come from Maoism, you know, struggle sessions and auto-critique, of course. But the epistemological element is not incidental, it's not unimportant, and it's not merely academic. It lays the foundation for all of the abuses we're seeing in these college campuses today, the imposition of people's identity politics on others, uh, there's no question identity politics has a postmodern provenance, and it is a problem because it is constantly focusing on groupism, and it's constantly reconstructing and re re reifying the very categories that it claims to be undoing. All right. Well, I know you both have more that you could say, but we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, Websites, uh, where should I link people who want to follow each of you guys? Uh, Thad first. Uh, RenegadeUniversity.com. You can take my course on what is postmodernism there. Ah, okay. And you can also take uh, Michael's course on postmodernism yes, at LibertyClassroom.com. Yes. Uh, Michael, uh, do you have a website or anything you, you want to link people to? Yes, it's michaelrechtenwald.com. Uh, Michael, R-E-C-T-E-N-W-A-L-D.com. All right. Both of those things will be linked to tomwoods.com slash 1784. My thanks to both of you gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everybody. That is our debate episode. Remember, it's Black Friday this week. So on Black Friday, head over to libertyclassroom.com and you will get the deal of a lifetime on the master membership there where you can undo the years of educational malpractice that you and I both endured in school and learn the real history, the real economics in courses you can consume anytime you want in your car, taught by me and by other people you can trust. So check that out, libertyclassroom.com, Black Friday. I'll see you tomorrow on Thanksgiving. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.